Greg and Lisa Mitchell, Jesse and Bethany Morell, let's just pray for the Cassios, the Galvans, and also lift up, amen, Paul, uh, excuse me, Paula Hart and her husband Chris as they're laboring there. They just went on staff this year. Let's also pray for the East Coast, amen, in uh, Cape Cod. Let's pray for Paul and Linda Campbell, uh, Chip and Lori Ganier, and then the uh, uh, work that's going on in Jacksonville. Let's pray for our leadership church there, amen, and the kings that are helping. Let's also pray and believe God together for uh, the East Rochester Church, Keith and Carrie Sullivan, that God's blessing would overshadow them as they have uh, just found a building for their church, that they finish uh, all the, the proceedings there, and, and God continues to bless them, amen, all their new converts making good choices, making good decisions, amen, and uh, we've got uh, some good numbers from the play, the play was uh, in Lowell, Massachusetts, and in Boston, Melbourne, Boston, over the weekend, and many people were getting saved through that event, and I'm going to give you the uh, exact numbers in a minute here, but let's pray for those churches. Let's pray for miracles to those families, and God to be glorified there, and uh, we're going to go ahead and pray for these uh, prayer requests here. If you ever have a need in your life, you need God to move, amen, we're going to pray for Lewis. Felix, you can fill out one of these from the back shelf there, and we'll pray. We'll believe God for your specific request, Beverly Flynn, amen. Let's pray for Angelina Polano. Uh, Joe and Kim need direction for their life, amen. Let's pray also for our police and firefighters and active military that God's overshadowing and blessing would be upon their lives, amen. Hey, perhaps there's people in your life, maybe your parents or your children that are not saved. Let's take a minute and pray for them that God can save them because we don't want them to go to hell. Man, we want miracles in their lives as well. Amen. Let's pray for their salvation. Jose Rodriguez. Amen. The Flynn family. Let's pray for Barry and Annie, the Moroccos, and uh, Jerome Jackson and his family. Perhaps there's a need in your life that I did not mention and you'd like to pray. Amen. And acknowledge that. Amen. Lift your hand if you have a uh, a need we want to agree with you in prayer. Amen. God sees your hand. And if you're listening online, that's you. You have a desperate need in your life. Amen. We believe God's with you. Amen. I'm gonna I'm gonna encourage you to pray yourself. Amen. To lift your voice and to start talking to God. And when you activate your faith through your lips, through your speaking, amen. God's really gonna bless you. He's gonna help you and then give you the miracle that you so desire. Amen. David Bergsland, can you open us up in prayer? When we subside, let's pray, church. God, we have no other choice but to call on your name, right your advocacy, now, God. God. You're a miracle working God. We're desperate to, for you to move in America, God. We obviously don't know what we're doing. We pray for a move upon uh, Lord, uh, the government, the agencies, God, our uh, amen. governor here in New York State, God, all our leaders, God. I pray for uh, the new mayor, God. I pray for uh, Bill Riley to be. Uh, uh, town supervisor, God, I pray for all our families, God. I thank you for those who uh, came to the altar this morning, God. Put your blessing upon them, your direction for their lives, God. Your share in their hearts, God. Put an edge upon them, Lord God. Help them, God, to proceed, God, to move forward in their Christian life. To grow and mature, God, I pray for East Rochester, God. Help Keith and Carrie Sullivan, Lord God. And move tonight upon this sermon message, God. I pray for souls converted. I pray for revelation about who you are tonight, about what you want to accomplish. Lord Jesus, we do pray for the politicians and yeah, the so long. Yeah, 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 yeah. We know, Lord, as the time gets short, it's going to get stranger and stranger. We ask, yeah, Lord, that you give us clarity of vision, that we can see what you're doing and know how to follow you, Lord. We know you have a path for this, you have a plan. Just give us the grace, Lord. everyone feel comfortable tonight. Amen.
Praise God, it's good to be in church, and I want to thank everybody for coming. A few announcements for the local church, and that is this midweek service on Wednesday at 7.30, amen, we'll be here, and 6.30 for prayer. If you want to join us, amen, it'd be great to, amen, get a hold of God together and begin to pray and watch what God can do in your life and in this town, amen. Praise God. We'll also be back in church on uh, Sunday morning at 10 o'clock for our adult Sunday school. We had a great... Uh, a number of people this morning that were asking questions and uh, being involved, amen, participating in the Sunday school. And then think about coming next Sunday at 10 o'clock, 1030 is our morning worship, amen. We'll be, amen, um, back in church uh, this uh, Saturday. We have outreach at 11 o'clock. If you want to come and make a difference in the earth, see what God is doing, amen. Give your testimony, give your time, and we go into the local community and we share the love of Jesus with uh, different neighborhoods. We'll go to the uh, malls or to you know Walmart and, and talk to people about Jesus, invite them to church. Hallelujah. Here's some testimony from over the weekend. Uh, my son in the East Rochester Church took the play Neon Lights, amen, to uh, Malden uh, on uh, Saturday, I believe, but uh, Friday might have been Lowell, Massachusetts, and uh, five prayed on the outreach in Malden. That was during the day, and five answered the altar call at the performance at the night, and then five more prayed in Lowell, amen, at the performance at the end of that play, amen. Let's give God praise for that, hallelujah. God, I thank you, God, that you've given results. God, I pray, touch those lives and be with them. And then if you'd like to see the play yourself, it's going to be performed uh, this upcoming Friday in Brockport, New York. There's two shows, one at 7 and one at 8.30. And if you would like any information about that, we're also planning on doing a haunted house. And that is something we have to put together kind of quickly. We have about a month to do it. If you have like one night a week, amen, uh, we'll be uh, here meeting at the building to uh, create the props and to get the plot together and to you know assign parts and to begin to rehearse that haunted house if you like doing something crazy scare the hell out of people get people saved get them to jesus amen it's going to be a lot of fun i see somebody clapping their fingers they got me excited praise god let's change the order of our service we'll take our uh offering right now. Amen. This is from the same book that I used this morning. This is from the book of Judges. And we have a Gideon, amen, who's the son of Manoah, right? We talked about how the angel came down and told him about having a son and uh, how the angel went up in their sacrifice, up in the flame. And this is, a, this is a little bit later portion of scripture here, Judges 6, verses 22 through 24. Now, Gideon perceived that that it was the angel of the Lord. So Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for I have seen the angel of God face to face. Then the Lord said to him, Peace be with you. Don't be afraid. Relax. You're not going to die. So Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, The Lord is Peace. To this day, it's still an Oprah of the Abizrites. So here we have the story of Gideon. You know, God spoke to Gideon and said, Gideon, you are a mighty man of valor. And Gideon is like, you talking to me? He's hiding in his dad's wine, wine press. He's like in the basement. He's afraid of what's going on. He's kind of a coward. It appears that he has no uh, ability to fight or to lead, but God's calling Gideon to become a leader in the scripture. He's a little nervous, a little freaked out seeing an angel. He builds an altar to God and he offers a sacrifice. Wow! God is going to use my life. This is an incredible thing. When God speaks to you and says, you know, you are going to be used of God. And we can follow through this scripture to the end and see how Gideon was used to use um, 300 men there in Israel and defeat the enemy miraculously. So God has a plan for your life and for mine, amen. It should be our 
natural response to give an offering to him. To build an altar. Whenever you give your money to God, we're going to talk about many ways of offering to God tonight. But there we have the opportunity here in an offering to give of our finances and build an altar. An altar means, God, I respect you. An altar says, God, part of my life is going to die. I'm going to give a sacrifice. It might not be easy for you, but it's more meaningful. Think about the widow who put in a quadrant or a very two mites, a very small little amount of money. Jesus saw it. He took notice of it. He said, this woman put in more than everybody else. They put it in out of their abundance. She put it in out of her poverty. She hardly had any money at all. So tonight, let's give, let's have a good response to God. Can I ask the usher to come forward and to pray over this offering? Amen. God loves a cheerful giver. Amen. Let's go ahead and give to God with a thankfulness in our heart that God's going to use us. Amen. Link online if you'd like to make a donation. Amen. Burning me. We greatly appreciate your help on the piano and our sister behind the computer there, helping you with all the words up on the screen. Can you say amen? amen. Praise God. This scripture this evening is Psalms 22, verse 3 through 5. We're going to read that in a minute. The moment seeming importune to worship. So many things needed prompt attention. No home for his wife and children. No shed for the cattle. So much was required to be done. It called for thought and planning and arranging and effort and toil. If ever there lived a man who could plead that these distracting necessities excluded the worship of God, that man was Noah. But not so with Noah. And shall be yielded to him all Amen is, was underneath God and Noah was very thankful and realized this after he didn't drown in the flood amen. with his family. Can you say amen? amen? The entire earth is wiped out and eight survivors. Noah was the father of the group. Amen. He who is first shall be last. He who is Vast shall have the best, and the earth's first building after the judgment shall be an altar for the worship of God. Noah's first care is to bless the care which was also cared for him. His first posture is the bended knee and the uplifted knife, as it were, with him as he, you know, God opened the door and he they're on dry land. He makes a sacrifice, an animal sacrifice. And God is pleased with that. His response was to build an altar. The first thing that Noah did was to worship God after the flood. And for you and I tonight, an altar connects us to God properly. For what he has not done, what did he not do? He didn't drown Noah and his family in the flood. And he also built the altar for what God was about to do. 
Amen. That's true for you and I. Look how God has been merciful to you. You've made bad decisions umpteen times, and God is sparing you from those consequences. For some reason, there's a covering over your life. He's been merciful to you. You could build an altar for that, or when he speaks to you in a service, you could respond by building an altar. God, you're going to use my life. This is going to be outrageous. I can't contain myself. Incredible miracles are before you. That is your future. He's about to do something tremendous. So let's read our scripture uh, from Psalm 22. We're going to read three scriptures this evening. Psalm 22, verses 3, 4, and 5. But you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you, they trusted and you delivered them. They cried out to you and they were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. I'd like to preach this sermon for you and I this evening called Enthroned in the Praises. Enthroning God through worship. What this means is that we're esteeming him. We're lifting above all other problems, all other deeds, all other idols in our lives, all other problems, all other people, we're lifting God up higher than all of them. We're esteeming him. That word praise is usually translated to, to the word prize. When we praise God, let's praise God. We're uh, thinking about God as a prize for us. And that word worship is easily translated into the word worthy. You place worth on uh, things all day long. You look, you know, through your device and you're scrolling through, you're shopping, you know, you're, you're saying this, you know, you want to look at this, you want to go buy this thing because it's worthy. It's worthwhile to you. You've made a judgment. So let's apply that to a, a worship service. Normally people think of worship and praise like, you know, this is what we do at the beginning of the church. It's just part of the liturgy. And some people suffer through it. Other people really get into it. Uh, secondly, it could be a giving or a financial offering. A way of worshiping God. A way of saying to God, you are number one in my life. And I'm going to praise you by giving you a financial offering. Amen. Thirdly, it could be maybe you're going to be devoting your time by coming to a church service. That's another way of saying, God, you are the most important thing in my life. I will make church a priority because that's your house. It's a house of prayer. It's a house where the people of God can come together. I'm going to respect it. I'm going to come, I'm going to get on outreach, or I'm going to start attending Bible studies or adult Sunday school. Devoting your time is a way of, amen, prizing or praising God. You could also devote your time by following up on people. You can invest in other people's lives. You could take people out for dinner. That would be radical. You can help people in the church sometimes. You know, you babysit their kids, and sometimes you help them. To, you know, they're moving. There's many ways you can get involved in your church. You can devote your time to your church family because they're important. That's a way of worshiping God. Time. What do you do with your time? How do you spend your time? Listen to this idea about companies and worship. Martin Lindstrom observed when people viewed images associated with strong brands like iPods, Apple, Harley Davidson, the Ferrari, and other cars, right? Their brains registered the exact same patterns of activity as they did when they viewed religious symbols or images. The bottom line, there was no discernible difference between the way the subject's brains reacted to powerful brands and the way that they reacted and acted to religious icons and figures. 
So many of you are looking for the crucifixes in here. You'll notice we do not have any. There's no crosses. There's no incense burning at the altar. There's no candles. All those things relate to your perceptions. Right? But God is not a God of this world and of temporal things. He's a Holy Spirit. He won't be contained to a, a little candle. <laughs> you can snuff that out. There's your light, God. Psst, gone. He's not going to be uh, demeaned or humiliated into, be, into residing in an object. Can anybody say amen? amen. <laughs> he's a spirit. He's, he's, a, he's not a tame lion, as you heard in, uh, about Aslan, if you ever watched uh, the, uh, is it Jared Tolkien or? Yes, yes, thank you. <laughs> He's not a tame lion. He's not going to be constricted or constrained or held in an object. So, in that worship for us this evening, it's not a feeling. Many people say, oh, what a great worship service it was. It was heavenly. Well, no, worship is not a feeling that you generate. Once I feel it, then I'm going to get into it. No, worship is obedience tonight. Obedience is... Amen. Is a way that we can worship God. It's the supreme form of worship. It's in its purest form. Amen. It could be in an assembly. It could be when you're gathered with your brothers and sisters. But it could also be privately. When you're dealing with things. When you're thinking about your family or your job or you know, getting divorced. Those things are... Amen. When you worship God, you're being obedient to his voice and you're doing what he wants you to do. That is the purest form of worship. Amen. So we need to trust God firstly. And each and every one of you here has an amazing future. He's promising to be with you through every trial, through every humiliation. He has an ability to protect us from our enemies. Amen. However many they are. However powerful they are. How many got enemies in here? Oh, everybody just loves you, right? <laughs> right? We have enemies. There's people that are positioned against us. There may not be physical people that are against us, but there are certainly spiritual uh, entities that are positioned against you to make you fail, to trip you up if you're a Christian. But when you trust in God, Amen. He brings his power against theirs, and they are, amen, just totally destroyed. Amen. Declaring. So what happens when we trust God? David had been in the assembly, amen, and he says, I will declare who you are. This is a way of, amen, worshiping God. In the assembly, verse 22, he says, I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will praise you. So, it, yes, it's good to worship God at home. It's good to sing your songs at Caleb. Turn up the radio in the car and sing at the top of your lungs. Yep, we do all that. And then there's the time when you get to come to church and sing with the saints of the living God. That's a little bit different. Amen. You can also give a testimony in your church. Amen. About something that's happened in your life. This is a way of worshiping God. Of saying, you know what? I was this or this was happening in my life. And I asked God to help me. And this is what happened. And he visited me. He helped me. You can give a testimony in church. You can speak. You can declare what God has done in your life in this church. That's a way of worshiping God. Or, or you had an outreach or you talked to somebody about Jesus or perhaps there was a miracle in your life and when you talk about it when you declare it amen that's when God gets worshipped and then because you're talking about him you are prioritizing his involvement in your life as the penultimate it's the priority it's the most amazing thing that you got going for you declaring what he's done it's powerful. Maybe you got a financial blessing. Maybe you got a new job. Maybe you had uh, a, an increase or you got a job. You got a job you didn't deserve. Amen. God needs to be glorified with that. Amen. You can glorify God. You can worship him 
as you bring attention to that, hallelujah, you are declaring his name here in the assembly to my brethren, it says here. It's a powerful expression of worshiping God. Amen. It could also be a personal experience that you can share with individuals or the whole assembly. Maybe one day you might want to stand up in here and give your testimony about what happened in your life. Maybe one night we'll just have a testimony service. You could tell us how you got saved. Wouldn't that be exciting? That's a way of declaring what God has done in your life. It's a way of worshiping God, speaking out. Amen. Some of you getting nervous. <laughs> That's a good nervousness. Amen. Think about it. So thirdly, amen, we need to contribute. Amen. Financially, we're thinking about money here. This is a small portion of it. But Jesus taught us it's better to give than receive. So in the assembly, David is writing, and he's the author of this psalm, by the way. He says, in the assembly, or when I come to church, my praise shall be of you in the great assembly. Verse 25, I will pay my vows before those who fear him. Amen. So David is saying, he's going to pay his tithes. I am going to give to God what I have vowed to give. That's a way of financially enthroning God. You give him the tenth. And then the tenth of your increase, that's 10% of what God has given you. You've got a gift, 10% of it. You've got an increase. There's something in your life you're getting money in. That should go to God. That's the 10%. That's the tithe. That's just the beginning point for somebody who wants to be a Christian who wants to uh, glorify God, who wants to worship God, amen, in their finances. Offerings are what you give after the tithe, amen. So all financial giving is not a church tax. Have you heard that before? Some people think, well, I can't go to church. I got one guy who texts me all the time because I can't come to church because I, got, I don't got any money to give you. We don't want your money. We want your spirit. We want your heart. We want your soul. It's not a church tax when you give your money. It's not a payment. You're not at a show or in a club. You're not here in a concert or something like that, and you got to pay your ticket. Paying your tithe is completely different. Giving money to the church is completely opposite to that. It's an opportunity to worship God financially. We have an offering every service. That's an opportunity. You could give God, I guess you could give to God anytime you want to. Now we have the link online. If God says, you need to give to that church, you can go, get on your device, click in the numbers, give them your credit card, bam! That's worship. I guess that could happen too. It doesn't have to happen just in church, which is, you know, fine. I'm all for that, I guess. We're moving towards becoming self-supporting, and we're seeing more people coming, and when more people come, they give more, and each and every one of us can contribute to the work. And then it's a, it's a great gift. It's a great opportunity to invest in something of eternity. Amen. Something of value, amen, that you're offering to God. More than your time and your talents. That's another thing we'll get into later maybe. But this is the financial portion of verse 25. And throning God, putting God on the throne, where we give financially also. Let's change the order here. And look at the promise, amen. If you put God first, he will deliver you. Let's look for a few minutes here at the life of David. David, uh, amen, in this scripture here is tormented. Some of you are going through some incredibly horrible times in your life, whether it's betrayal, whether it's a financial loss, or you tried to do something and you failed Amen. I want you to insert yourself as you think about what David went through. He writes in verse 22, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? And from the words of my groaning, verse 2, Oh my God, and I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. I cry in the night season, and you're silent. David had been through some incredible 
horrible times in his life when he was attacked. And then as a shepherd boy, he's protecting the, sh the flock. He's attacked by a lion and a bear. He kills both of them. He was attacked as a soldier when he first killed Goliath the giant. Amen. With a stone. He fought many battles for King Saul. And he won many battles for Israel. He was maligned also as a, he was being driven out of Jerusalem. There's Shimei, who called him a murderer and a rebel and a bloodthirsty man. He tried to curse him. He did curse him. David was betrayed by a friend. Many of us can insert ourselves in any of these things here. Psalm 55, verse 12, for it is not an enemy, he writes, who reproaches me, then I could bear it. Nor is it one who hates me, who has exalted himself against me, then I could hide from him. Verse 13, but it was you, a man of my equal, my companion, and my acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together, and we walked in the house of God in the throng. But this man betrayed him. Some of you can relate to this. There was rebellion against his life. His very own son, Absalom, would have been glad to see him die. He rebelled to take the throne away from David, his father. David, earlier in his life, was hunted like an animal because of King Saul's jealousy. Saul has killed his thousands, but David is ten thousands. And Saul's like, wait a minute here. That's not right. And he becomes very jealous of him. Tries to drive a spiritful. <laughs> he hunts him in the wilderness for months like an animal, chasing him. Trying to kill him. David is running and he pretends madness. He goes to another country even, King Ashish. And he pretends madness, this drool dripping off his beard. Amen. David has gone through a few things like you and I. Now think about uh, his brothers in the beginning. He was hated by his brothers. David, what are, what are you doing here at the valley? You just came, you're, you're so naughty. You should be with those few sheep in the wilderness. Why aren't you back tending to them? They hated him, kind of like Joseph. Now, David's been through some things. He was attacked on many fronts. He's been tormented. He even lost his faith from time to time. Think about the delay there was as David is a young boy and Samuel the prophet comes and anoints him in front of his, all his brothers. He says, you're going to be the next king. They hate him for that for sure because they all got passed up. And so David, from that time, he wasn't the king. It took many, many, many years to finally attain that. There was a delay. How many here have felt the pain of delay? Amen. God has given you a promise. You're going to get married. Like, whoa, God, what's that going to happen? I don't know, but we're figuring that out right now. And God's setting you up with a spouse, perhaps, or maybe a new job. And uh, you've been promised ministry. God says, I'm going to use your life. And you don't see it happening. There's a delay there. You're not really seeing it happen yet. like you and I and that we have personal struggles like David. Even the old man, he, he was a man of God after God's own heart. David. He had a few bumps in the road. We don't see God moving and we say, well, he's just taking his sweet old time, isn't he? He is doing his own things, his own way and he doesn't need our approval. Can anybody say amen? Right. amen. He wants to do it his way. And many of us would learn that lesson and avoid a lot of pain, a lot of wasted time if we just acknowledge God. God, you are on the throne. You are the king. Have your way in my life. And that's a way of worshiping him. Amen. He has simply, some people think he's just disappeared. We, we don't see him. We don't feel him. That's why Christianity is so awesome. It's not by feelings that we serve God. It's by knowing Him 
that he is going to show up and that he's going to help us ultimately. He cares for us. This kind of thing is unfortunate because we let our emotions get the best of us and we lose our focus on who God is. We lose our reasoning and our memory fails us because we forget about his promises. We lose focus of God's promises. We forget what he's done in the past. There's many things that will attack you and I and then that will try to get us to not care about enthroning him anymore. But we must put God first always, even in the dark times. You and I have suffered many things, amen, and God is still the same. We've been through some horrible situations, some awkward conditions of our life. We've made some bad choices, amen, but God has not changed. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, amen, those dark times. God is still there. Maybe you don't see him because it's dark, but he is still there. Even in our successes, when you have a revival in your life and your finances are breakthrough, amen. But this is not what defines us. When everything's going good, it's easy to talk about Jesus. It's easy to come to church. It's easy to be a Christian when everything's going good around you. That's not what defines you. What defines you is when and then these, these oppressive things come against you and you respond and you say, God, you are in the throne. Amen. You are responsible for everything good that happens to me. And I will continue to praise you. I will put you on top. I will put you at the beginning of all my choices. Amen. How about when you're persecuted? People find out that you're a Christian and they don't give you the, the raise that you deserve. Or people in your family, they you're living for Jesus and they're like convicted by your testimony. And uh, they come against your faith. They start mocking your faith. What are you going to do? Are you going to still engage the enemy? Are you going to keep fighting for what is right? Are you going to keep pressing in for all that God has for you? Even when the devil, he throws a curveball at you, we need to always put God first. Amen. So let's close this evening and talk about enthroning God in his praises. Amen. Psalm 22, verse 33. It starts, but you are holy. You are enthroned in the praises of Israel. When we put God in the place that he belongs then he can execute power. God is a God of power. Amen. It's not the God of the Hindus or the uh, Brahmins or the, the Buddhists or the Muslims. This is a God of power who does miracles, who intervenes in people's lives, who heals sick bodies, who saves corrupted minds. He can execute power. Amen. That is what we desperately need when we enthrone him, put him on the throne so he can do what he does best. Amen. Our faith allows God to do incredible miracles. Unexplainable things are going to happen. Why? Because you are enthroning God. You're giving him the access to your life and he's putting that power inside of you when you enthrone him. He can do some mighty, majestic things. You know, when he is in the, the proper place in our hearts, the center of our lives, working his rule. When he's reigning in our hearts, I mean, he's not competing with other things. He is the king of kings. Hallelujah. And then Acts 2.47 this recalls the account of the uh, first Christians there. The church is moving. They were praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those 
who were being saved. So in the scripture here, we understand that God is coupling the whole idea of us praising God with bringing souls to repentance. They were praising God and having favor with all the people and God was adding to the church, adding another person, bringing another person, another family to church, doing miracles, working salvation. Acts 16, verse 24, having received such a charge, he put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the prisoners were listening to them. So was the jail keeper. Do you know that? They were amazed. Suddenly there was an earthquake, a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's chains were loosed. So here we have an example of Paul and Silas and worshiping God. They're in prison. This has got to be the deepest, the darkest most disgusting room they ever slept in, cockroaches everywhere. And yet they have a joy in their hearts. They know that God is with them. God is gonna help them get out of there. God has a plan for their life. He's going to use them. He's not done with them. And so there's a miracle that happens there as they're singing songs. Amen. Worshiping God, enthroning him, even in prison, in the middle of your trial, or in the middle of your suffering, keep singing songs. For Paul and Silas, the Philippian jailer gets saved. Why? He heard their faith. He heard the songs. He's like, I can't believe those Christians are still singing. I wish they would shut up so I could get my family to bed. He heard them. He saw their faith. After they were, their chains were busted off their arms, the doors were swung wide open. They could have ran. They could have got... But they said, don't kill yourself. We're all here and accounted for. We're, we're not going to leave. And so he was blown away. This is why he got saved. Hebrews 13, 15. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But do not forget to do good and to share. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Amen. Continually offering the sacrifice of our lips. That means declaring in the assembly, worshiping God in songs. We have opportunity in our service. Um, it's just an, another chance of us to praise God, to worship him. And then one man said that worship is not about you. It's about God. So when you're worshiping God, you don't put yourself in the equation. You just surrender and let it rip. Amen. And God will deliver you, my friend. Insert your own life when you think about David. David can record his emotions and experiences honestly and up front. His faith was not perfect. Amen. But his faith was backed up by a God who eventually showed up for him. He showed up for the lion and the bear. From the giant, God gave him victory. David slays him, cuts off his head, and holds it up high. He, he saves him or protects him from the assault of an insane king and from the rebellion of his sons, their rejection of him. And then from betrayal of friends and family. And then God delivers you also from the assaults of the enemy tonight. When the devil starts throwing your past at your feet and reminding you of who you used to be, amen, you can remind him of his future. Hallelujah. And that is to burn in the lake of fire. You can also worship God. Keep worshiping. And when your friends talk junk about you and they try to throw you off your game, don't ever give up on God. Keep praying. Keep reading your Bible. Still keep coming to church. When you feel like God is not there, don't believe it for a minute. He's there. Amen. He's with you. Amen. Keep praising God. Keep worshiping. He will deliver you if you trust in him. Verse 15, I close. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. 
to which you are called in one body and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. Let's close our eyes and bow our heads if we could for the next few minutes. No one's moving around. Let's open up this altar. Amen. For those who are not saved. Amen. We're going to sing a song in a minute here. But I want to give an invitation to you that you can live for God. You don't have to be bound by your sin, by your old man, by your failures, by your mistakes. Amen. You can start a new life. And that's called being born again. Jesus said in John 3, 3, that you must change because who you are is really not going to get you into heaven. You've been worshiping yourself. You've been worshiping your idols or your Hollywood stars or different, you know, you've been following things that, you know, God says this is not important. This is what is important. And that is a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. God is so darn serious about this. He was sending his own son to die on that cross, a bloody cross, for your sins to change you, to give you a new life, to make you and I a new creation so that the old passes away and all things become new. How many would there be tonight? You're not saved. You have no relationship with God. Yet God is calling you right now and he's drawing you to himself with all heads bowed and you no one's looking around. And you're saying, preacher, that's me. I want you to pray for me. I'm really not saved. And then would there be anybody tonight you'd like to pray for salvation? Give your life to Jesus. Have all your sins washed away. Make him Lord of your life. When you make him Lord, that means you're making him a master. You're making him in control of your life. You're giving him rule and reign in your heart as a king. And then when you submit to him, he's going to amen, help you and richly bless you and become your God, become a king to you. And then destroy all your enemies. How many would there be? You not say you want to give your life to Jesus. Is there anybody here? Or you're backslidden. Maybe you are far away from God. One time you were right with God, but now you've been tripped up and you've been deceived. You've been uh, torn from your relationship, the covenant that you had with God at one time. You were serious about Christianity, but now not so much. Now you're more than lukewarm, but you're cold and you're dead to God. You're really not serving Him. And He wants to bring you to this altar tonight where you can pray, you can give your life to Jesus. Amen. And when you give your life to Jesus, you're enthroning him. You're making him the king and the Lord of your life. He's going to help you to start over. He's going to give you the things that you're lacking in your character. He's going to give you miracles. And then if you're not saved or you're backslidden, you want to get saved tonight. You want to get your life together. Amen. You want to get back on track. How many would there be? You want to go for Jesus. Praise God. And then maybe you're listening online and you're feeling the, the pull or the tug of the Holy Spirit. You're getting convicted. You know that you're wrong. And God's dealing with you and you're ready to pray. Amen. I want to pray this prayer with you. If that's you, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. And that means uh, closing your eyes and bowing your head and removing all distractions and saying, Jesus. I am a sinner and I have disobeyed and now I am lost. I have not obeyed you. Forgive me for my sins and give me a new life. I repent of my old thinking. Help me to think differently. Help me to worship you. Help me to praise your name. Thank you for the blood of the cross. And I thank you for redemption. And I know you're healing my heart. In Jesus' name. 
Praise God. If that's you tonight, you gave your life to Jesus, amen, I'm going to ask you to contact us either through the website or send us a text or an email and let us know how we can serve you better, amen. Perhaps you're a Christian in here, amen, and uh, you've been through some things, amen. I just want to encourage you to keep worshiping God, keep putting Him on top, lifting Him up in every trial and circumstance that you're going through, amen. And as you enthrone Him, amen, He is going to literally and technically show up and be there with you, even in the darkest time. Amen. Let's open up these altars and sing this song. We'll praise God in this worship for all in all. Hallelujah. It's wonderful to be in God's presence. 
Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Let's go ahead and close. Uh, if you'd like to get involved in the haunted house, you can talk to me uh, personally about that. Amen. And um, you have a good week. Hallelujah. God bless you. Amen. And uh, call somebody in the church. Amen. Let them know that you care about them. And, uh, you know, encourage other people here. And uh, God's really going to use your life. I believe that. Amen. Let's enthrone Jesus. Let's go ahead and believe God together. Amen. Even in the darkest time, he is there. Amen. Give him the lordship over your life. And Brother David, can you bless us as we go? Yeah, Lord. We, we know that you have plans for us and you've made promises oh, to all of us. We're trusting you to bring them to pass. As we go out this week, we'll open our eyes to see what you're doing so that we can follow you and you can bless our efforts so that you can make our lives fruitful in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank you for your faithfulness. Amen. Lord bless you. Have a good week.